Is this Jason? Yes, it is. Hello, this is Travis. We're, I was going to call you. Yes, hey, Travis. Hey, how are you doing? All right, thanks. Hey, so uh, I was calling you in response to the questions I'd asked you online. And I viewed those videos you suggested. And I don't think that they quite were responsive to what I was asking. Okay. So, um, initially, looking at my initial comment to you, it says I've um, been pondering just being LDS and wanted to ask what you believe um, evangelical churches have to offer as a replacement for the literal sonship of God as, uh, you know, of course, as it's taught by the LDS church, eternal progression and eternity, as well the purpose and meaning to our mortal condition. tried to address that as I've understood what you were asking there. Right. And I, uh, I mean, on a, on a surface level, it's we're offering a different God, a different gospel. Um, and, and I don't know that you have agreed with that. Um, I've had a, a bishop has been an instructor at the LDS Institute for 30 plus years who readily agrees that we're talking about a different God, a different gospel. Uh, well, I don't, I don't, we, I don't disagree with sorry. that. Okay. I mean, I, I, so, I absolutely believe that Christianity is a different religion than Mormonism. Yeah. I, I don't I don't personally even as a Latter Day Saint I don't consider myself a Christian. Okay, well that's at some level that's actually a little bit of an encouragement to hear because that's the position LDS used to take thirty years ago. But um, there's been in the last twenty five years a move toward we're Christians too, uh, sort of mentality and that Mormonism embraces all these things and says you know bring your truth and we'll just add to it um, but it, this was the first conversation I actually had with uh, Alma Allred who I was referring to and he readily agreed no we're not talking about simply addition we're talking about a different God a different gospel and that makes things a whole lot easier to discuss than if it's a, a view that we have um, some L some LBS think that they have simply a fuller revelation, and they're just adding things to the same basic God and gospel that we hold to. Well, I don't know. I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that. Disagree with that characterization either, though. Well, to some extent, it doesn't matter. I mean, the um, I mean, we're we're talking about generalizations, but. Let's, let's let's clarify. We've we've had. I think we've talked past each other some. If you want to know what is our understanding of the purpose of things, basically, uh, we are creatures of dust and ashes. We are of a fallen race. We're by nature slaves of sin. Our fundamental problem is that we have, we're at war with God, who is our life. And the gospel is that we are able to be reconciled to him and not simply forgiven but adopted of a God who is far, far more glorious, a God who holds all of reality in existence outside. I mean, he is... He's transcendent of his creation, and he is a holy God, and his, uh, he's not. What what makes it, what makes that God holy? He is. Um, when That's, you look at the Ten Commandments, 
That's something I often hear Christians say. I don't think I've ever had it really clarified what it means. That it's, it's commonly repeated that God is holy, but I don't exactly understand what that means. Well, to some extent, I mean, you can get into the etymology of it and you get into things like separate, apart. Uh, he is other. He is, um, he is separated from sin is the implication in Scripture. Uh, the what we what we understand from that is God is life, and He commands us not to murder one another. Uh, when we when we murder someone or even hate them in our hearts, we're assaulting the image of God. Uh, God is faithful. He calls us not to commit adultery. God is truth. And therefore, uh, he, we're told he hates lies. So we are by nature a uh, hating, murdering, stealing, adulterous, uh, you know, fallen humanity. And the the separateness of God is uh, from that is made very clear we're told that God cannot lie we're told that he is light and in him there is no darkness we are fallible changing human beings we're told that he doesn't change and and I guess I guess with that in mind not to cut you off but I guess with that in mind why did he make us that way though and I guess that's one of my big issues with the disconnect between um, Mormonism and Christianity, is why did why did the Christian God make humans in such a depraved state? Uh, he did not. We he made us uh, innocent. Well, and that's the thing is is when at what point was I innocent then? Okay, uh, you weren't. Uh, Adam was innocent. Right, right, but you you see um, that you see why why I'm having an issue with that, you know what what Adam's disposition was when he was created, is is not really relevant to mine. I mean, I I was created according to Christianity, depraved, and fallen. I was made that way. I did not previously exist. I came into existence as a depraved, and fallen creature. I was created that way. Now. I understand that, that it's Adam's fall that created that circumstance, but effectively, through the, the process, at least as I understand it, Adam was created and formed in a different way in which I was. And so God allowed his actions to impact ultimately my creation. By allowing that to occur and creating that scenario, God, in effect, created me in a state of depravity. Does that make sense? Okay. I understand what you're saying. But let me give you a little bit of context that I think will help the conversation. The old theologians used to speak of man in his fourfold state, that he was that Adam was created able to sin. And you'll often hear this in Latin, posse peccari, <clears throat> able to sin. When Adam sinned, he brought a curse upon himself and upon all his posterity, and that we are not able not to sin. Through Christ, we have uh, the promise of a new heart, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows us a way of escape. We are able not to sin. We're still sinners. We're not perfect. Uh, but there is, a, there is a change with that new heart. Uh, the Lord chastises us. The, the, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. We're not... Uh, we are different than we than we were before. When we are with Christ, then we are not able to sin. 
then we will be glorified. So, how do we know that God is not the author of sin? He tells us. How do we know that God is sovereign? He tells us. Well, I... I well, but bear, bear, bear with me for just a moment, because okay. this is one of the, the fundamental issues I think is going to be between us. If, if you... If your reasoning uh, is your is your basis of authority that you're taking these things and asking yourself, is this reasonable to me? We're going to come to a very different place because my understanding is my reason is fallible and my reasoning needs to be corrected by the revelation of God. Now, both of us uh, or the typical LDS agrees that God has spoken. The question is, what do we do with what he has said? Now, for many LDS, they see the scriptures as subordinate to the living prophet, and uh, scriptures can change and, and um, contradict one another and things like this. Um, that's an issue of difference between us. But in terms of how how do uh, is God the author of evil? No, God is good. Was God obligated to uh, provide atonement for Adam that day? No. I don't know if you saw the uh, Temples Made With Hands video. It gets into more of this. But Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. God stripped some of those fig leaves and closed them in the skins of dead animals. We see in the very next chapter, Abel's sacrifice is a sacrifice of blood. The, the, the theme we see throughout the Old Testament, that it is that the wages of sin is death. And therefore, um, there has to be death for sin. Adam was supposed to die that day. Years ago, I had someone come in, and uh, it was at the end of the service. Right, well, but, I mean, Adam was supposed to die, but he did not. Right. That's One of the, um, if you'll bear with an anecdote for just a moment. Sure. Uh, a fellow came into our, one of our services right at the very end. He came up to me afterwards. He said, are you the pastor? I said, yes. He said, I got a question for you. I never find any, found anyone who was able to answer. And he showed me the promise in, uh, in Genesis uh, 3, in the day that you eat there, you shall surely die. And then he flips over a few pages and says, Adam died at 930 years of age, and he slams the Bible shut. He says, see, the Bible contradicts itself. I said, no, you're missing the point of all the rest of the Bible. There was death that day, the death of a substitute. All the lambs, all the, the uh, cattle and goats, all the sacrifices, through all those uh, millennia, leading up to Christ, pointed to him. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So atonement was made. There was the death of a substitute, and it's pointing to Christ. Right, and I, and I, 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 I guess I can follow that, but I mean, you understand that that's a theological conclusion. That's not actually what the text says. That's not what Genesis 3 says, but... It's what's made clear in, in what follows. Right, but but you're talking about adding, and I guess I guess looking at the Bible, I mean, it's clear to me that the Bible is not, you know, and that's that's a different issue. I think you you addressed sola scriptura in one of the the videos, the idea that the Bible is a complete and uh, uniform text, which I mean, I think. From a secular perspective, from a practical perspective, that's just simply not the case. The Bible is not a, a complete text. It's a series of texts that have been put together and assembled in that way. And so, 
cobbling to, cobbling together different passages to 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 reach a theological conclusion. I understand that religion does that, but that's not necessarily um, how the, how the texts are written. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, what issues do you have with the Old Testament canon? Well, I don't have any specific issues. My my issue with it is is that, well, for example. I, I believe that that gentleman was correct. I mean, God, Adam was told that the consequence of partaking of the fruit would be death, and not not a spiritual death. A lot of people disagree and say, well, he spiritually died because he was separated from God, but it's not that's not the death he's he's referring to. It's obvious in the text that God is referring to a physical death. That's why he removes the tree of life, which grants life. Because proximity to God is not is already occurring, so He removes the tree of life, which allows them to live forever, and so they would suffer death, but they don't suffer it the day that they eat. Um, Adam lives 930 years, for example, right. and so the text seemingly contradicts itself. So, I mean, I, I've read a little bit about that, and I know that some scholars believe that. Genesis chapters one, 1 and 2 are two separate accounts of creation and similar problems go throughout the throughout that section of Genesis that talks about the the creation and the the fall and so there's a there's an argument to be made that those are different accounts that were cobbled together so whether or not I I, I mean I I personally don't really care about that what I'm what I'm more concerned about is what what is Christian theology developed in in relation to those things to make to to create a worldview that makes sense. Well, be careful of basing conclusions on things you hear uh, from various sources. Scrutinize those sources. I do, I, and that's what I'm but, saying. I'm. But, I, that's why I'm, that's why I'm asking you. I'm not. I, I understand I, I'm the not, different I'm not arguments. Giving you a hard time. No, no, no. And I know you're not. I'm, and I'm, and I'm not either. The, the issue is, is you, I, I am coming to you to ask you questions that are concerning to me regarding religion, gener, religion generally, and Christianity specifically. And so, and as I, I as and I, I appreciate that, I'm, you, you have some misconceptions that I would like to uh, respectfully engage a bit because if we skip over those we're going to have very different understandings of authority well don't don't worry about it you won't offend me i don't get offended okay well let's you can say anything you well, like and you of, won't offend in me. terms of cobbling things together uh, you've talked about the canon being cobbled together you've talked about genesis being cobbled together the the the, the arguments that are generally offered in terms of a cobbled together uh, genesis simply don't hold up in the light of actual ancient Near Eastern research. They, they come from a late 18th, primarily 19th century German higher critical approach that was very ignorant of much of ancient Near Eastern writing. And what they did is they basically tried to take the Bible and fit it into a paradigm that they constructed in their own heads more than based on uh, the actual evidence. If you read the Enuma Elish, if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you read the various ancient Near Eastern texts, uh, you find that what they were trying to argue, that you have a Yahwist, you have an Elohimist, you have a, a priestly source, um, you have a Deuteronomist, and that these things have all been cobbled together, it flies in the face of the way that people actually wrote in the second millennium BC. You can go back to the library of Ashurbanipal. You can read inscriptions that were made at the time that an event took place, and this literary theory that if you have different names it must be different sources means you have multiple writings being cobbled together describing a, a, a current event and it simply just doesn't hold water 
this is an artificial construct that people are imposing on Genesis. And in numerous circles, it gets propagated. There are some LDS who have picked up on some of this. It's been promoted down at BYU because it helps undermine criticism. I'm happy to deal with that at any length that you like. I won't, I'm not saying we need to focus on that. My, my point in raising the issue of canon is that we have the same canon that of the Old Testament as the Jews. And that this is not something that was cobbled together. It is the same... Um, the vast majority of the New, of the Old Testament books are cited in the New Testament as Scripture. Nothing is cited in, in the New Testament as Scripture that's not in the Old Testament. We have the exact same canon. Uh, they number them differently. Uh, they combine Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, sometimes they'll combine uh, the minor prophets together, things like this. So, I mean, you end up with different numerations, but you end up with the same 39 books of the Old Testament that you have today. People raise questions because of the Apocrypha. These are intertestamental books that were included in the Septuagint that the Church of Rome declared to be deuterocanonical in, I think, 1565, roughly, uh, at the the Council of Trent, and people used to say, see, we don't even know what the canon is. Well, we do. None of the, none of, none of the Apocrypha was uh, recognized by the Jews as Scripture. It was not recognized by the Church as Scripture. They were writings that described intertestamental periods. Um, you have the story of the Maccabees, you have... Um, these, these other things taking place around the 2nd century B.C. But the Jews didn't understand them to be Scripture. The re, uh, Jerome, the, the, the translator of the Latin Vulgate in the 4th century, made very clear we should never confuse these, these intertestamental writings as uh, with Scripture, because they're not. They weren't even written in Hebrew, for one thing. The original is in Greek. So, know. so with we know what the old we, we have the same we have the same Old Testament canon Jesus and the apostles used. We have the same Old Testament canon that the Jews still have. We have the same Old Testament canon that uh, the vast majority of the early church clearly recognized. You have uh, some people who did not read Hebrew, like Augustine, who was confused about um, the nature of, of the or the. Um, uh, Apocrypha in the Septuagint. So we have the same Old Testament canon. The New Testament canon was understood very early on that these are the writings of the apostles. These were men who had been given by Jesus the authority to bind and to loose. This was a something you read in Josephus. This is something the Pharisees uh, claim describes. Um, the Pharisees claimed that they had the ability to authoritatively interpret the Old Testament. Remember Jesus' condemnation in Matthew 23 where he says, you bind heavy burdens on men and you will not as much as lift your finger to, uh, uh, to loose them. The binding and loosing in terms of authoritative interpretation of the Old Testament, Jesus gives that authority to the apostles. The apostles in their writings and recognized by the church they are speaking for Christ they are set apart they're given miraculous sign gifts to testify to their authority as apostles they, they, they heal the sick they raise the dead um, there, there were signs and wonders that accompanied them and their writings were seen as authoritative within the church so is it, is it your conclusion then that, that as a result of the loss of those sign gifts with the apostles, that that would be an indicator that the canon closed? Yes, that, so, is, an, that is an indicator. 
Okay, and so the canon closed the result. And so I guess you also conclude that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually wrote those Gospels. Yes. And you'll find a host of people who will claim otherwise. Uh, you'll have people who will say, well, all scholars are agreed that Mark was the first uh, gospel written. The primacy of Mark is not an established fact. Right, it's, some some believe Luke was written first. Honestly, um, I, I, I find great merit in what Eusebius wrote. Uh, granted, he's writing in the 4th century, but Eusebius said that Matthew was written first, Mark was basically a condensation of it, and Luke, um, Matthew was written to a Gentile, or excuse me, uh, Matthew was written to a, a primarily Jewish audience, Luke reworks it towards a uh, Gentile audience, and then John writes last of all. Well, I, 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 I struggle with that purely from the perspective of Matthew and Luke's birth narratives. I just simply reject those. I don't believe that those are historical in any degree. Um, well, would you like it? Would, would you be open to evidence? Uh, sure, I would be. I haven't seen any to date, but I think that they're fundamentally right, well, preposterous. Um, I'm happy to prioritize whatever you would like. Well, and I'm not. I'm not really concerned. I mean, and and I guess that that was my problem, Jason. I didn't want to really wanted to get into the delving of the the canon because ultimately, what it really comes down to is I don't believe religion is evidence based. Religion is belief. Um, it's theology. It's the the things that we extrapolate from whatever sources we choose to extrapolate them from. And we systematize them, and that forms a religious belief. Uh, Christianity is no different than any other religion in the sense that it has its specific doctrines that identify it as Christian. You know, you've, you've said that um, Mormons aren't Christian, and they're not Christian because they hold beliefs that are not consistent with the, the fundamental doctrines and tenets of Christianity. Um, Mormons who are saying that they're Christian are doing so based on a simple dictionary definition that anybody that follows the teachings of Christ is a Christian. And so that's why I think where, where Mormons are simplifying the argument, I disagree with that position. I wish that I could talk to the general authorities of the church and convince them to quit calling us Christians um, because I don't believe that that title holds any real significance. And if we believe different things, then we need to just accept that we believe different things and that we're a different thing. But ultimately, I'm looking at the... The, the religious philosophy um, surrounding Christianity for purposes of making sense. Um, I've had issues with Mormonism, um, but I do find that a lot of its, its principles make sense. They're logical and they're consistent. Um, but one of the fundamental problems I have, as I said earlier, is the fall. I don't see, I don't understand that at all from a Christian perspective. It doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to address anything that you like. Um, I realize you know, you're reaching out. You want some answers. Uh, I'm not trying to distract you. I'm not trying to... No, no, and I understand that. I, we're, we're... No, I just, I, I think but, that, that maybe we can save the canon for a, a, another day. Because it sounds yeah, like it I'm might fine. be a I'm, I'm long discussion. I, but I mean, my, my my plea to you on that on on some of these things is you've you've come to conclusions about the authority of Scripture. I've actually reached no there. conclusions, Jason. I I don't have conclusions. I I, I really okay. haven't. I I don't have any things that I I define and and say. I find no evidence, for example for the birth narratives in Luke and Matthew. I think that they're... I don't believe they're statements of fact because I don't think that they they correlate with one another and they don't comport with history. Um, uh, I, and I, I and know I, the arguments... At, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure you're very familiar with them. And and so I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know that we need to argue them back and forth. I'm, well, my, my encouragement to you is simply this. I'm happy to suspend that issue. Uh, 
but understand that it's easy to hear one side of the argument and believe it to be overwhelming. Uh, my plea to uh, Mormons, to Catholics, to atheists, and whoever you want to pick out there, my argument has always been, let's get everything out on the table. Right, and I... Well, because and I, but because I, no one should have anything to fear from the truth. No, and I... And, and I'm, I'm happy... There's, there's, a, there's a sort of a Gordian knot here in terms of we have a lot, lots of various ways we could go. Um, but I think it would be helpful to talk about the statement you made just a moment ago where you said that religion is not evidence-based. Um, and, and my, I, I'd like to address that. It's like, it's a sure, topic. sure. I mean, I, I don't... I don't know. I mean, can you can you prove God exists? I believe that we all know that there is a God. Right, but every but but that's one. That's my point. I, I guess, Jason, please, that's my please, point. Please believing please that there's me. a God is just a choice please. you make. No, please bear with me. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to be patient on my implied trip. Please try to be patient, not interrupt me. I. Sure. Um, I believe that every atheistic position is, every non-Christian position is ultimately absurd. Some atheists will argue that anything that is not scientifically uh, verifiable, anything that, that, that does not engage uh, anything that is not measurable is not real. The problem with that is that then science cannot prove science. Math is not uh, material. Uh, logic, the, the laws of logic are not material. When you begin to go down this road, you end up with an absurdity where you're arguing the only things that are real are science, things that are um, measurable, quantifiable, and that these are the things that are real. Some people then swing the pendulum to the other extreme and everything becomes uh, subjective. My argument is that science, if you study the history of science, finds its fertile ground in the Christian West because we're dealing with a God who is not a pantheistic God. Um, you have a, a God who is reasonable, a God who has order about the way that he does things. You look at pantheism, it is typically very circular in its understanding, and it tends to turn people inward to know the truth because that is what's real rather than the external Christianity gave the epistemological basis for there being an objective reality outside of ourselves and that we know God through natural revelation and better understanding the world around us the Internally, we know that there is a God because we're moral beings. You'll hear atheists who uh, seem to thrive on moral outrage, but they have no basis for morality in a mechanistic, materialistic worldview. Why do you think that? Because I've heard them argue their positions for 30 plus years. Well, I'm not. A, I'm not an atheist, right. but I'm just saying. Why? Why do you believe no, no, that they don't have a basis for morality? No. What What is moral about the uh, reorganization of atoms from from a from a materialistic worldview? What is the difference between? pushing a little old lady in front of a bus or helping her across the street. Right, and I get that, and but you you do understand that their argument is is that they've 
um, we developed a social contract and as a result of survival mechanisms we found that living in polite society and determining that killing one another for example is contrary to our survival mechanisms that living in a in a cooperative manner is is a much more beneficial way in which to survive and so i think that that argument is is succinct i don't know that it necessarily is correct but i mean i think it's some basis for a morality essentially uh we sponsored a debate at the university of utah between a ruling elder in our church and a uh, professor of philosophy from UVU. We co-sponsored it with the Humanist of Utah. I've I've not simply listened to other people's debates. I've I've helped put them together. Essentially what atheists do in general. I'm sure there are exceptions, but in general they they tend to draw the draw your attention away they, they they use misdirection talking about social contracts things like this but that doesn't really deal with morality it's it's, it's strictly pragmatic what does it matter if i do something virtuous or unvirtuous if it doesn't affect my social connections what if I can push the little lady in front of the bus and no one will ever know? What what if I help the little lady, lady across the street? Um, I mean, and she has dementia; she's not going to remember. Uh, what is good in a materialistic universe? There's nothing that's good. There's also nothing that's bad. And so we go back to what I was trying to tell you before. Every position outside of Christianity ends up in absurdity. We know there's good and evil. We know that we're more than simply biochemical organisms with no past, no future, and no purpose. We know that there is beauty. We know that there's truth. Evolution cannot explain us. They can... They can use all kinds of word games but you cannot explain humanity you cannot explain uh, our genius we we, we uh, explore space we, we, we um, are capable of amazing technologies and yet we are also seriously broken people we use our genius to our own destruction well, and, and, and just real quick while I'm thinking of it you you mentioned something that I, I I think is inconsistent maybe you can reconcile the inconsistency if we're born we are born in sin fallen however however it's defined but basically we're enemies to God is that correct yes so from whence do people who are not redeemed or reborn get their morality? So you can't say that, like an atheist, you know, somebody who has never believed in God can still act morally, even, even under the umbrella of the Christian definition of morality. But if they're still in a yeah. fallen state, how do they do that? Because I, I've used the illustration before of a bonsai tree. Are you, are you familiar with the Japanese bonsai trees? Just from Pat Maria uh, from the Karate Kid. Okay. I mean, essentially, you take that tree and you plant it in your yard, and it grows into a, a sizable tree. But if you limit its nutrition, if you trim its roots, if you, if you basically... Um, put constraints on that tree you can turn it into what you see in the karate kit uh, a tabletop ornam you know, ornamental uh, plant the God we're, we're all made in the image of God uh, that image is not is spiritual 
not material, as Joseph Smith would claim. We are we are created to have fellowship with God. We're unique in all creation in that we were created in the image of God. We're reasonable. Uh, we're, we, we are um, personal beings. And that image has been defaced through sin. It has not been obliterated through sin. So we have two basic things here. We have the, 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 the ruined image of God that is still present. We have God's constraint. And so you can have unbelieving people who are capable of great sacrifice, the people who are capable of, um, of great acts of kindness, and yet people, the same people who, you know, will stop and help you on the side of the road when you're broken down and be very generous to you, may be on their way to kill their, their wife. And so there's a, um, we're not what we, uh, my understanding is that apart from the grace of God, I was a monster. I've I've seen um, well how much truth there was to what he said. I don't know. Um, fellow that lived here, flirted with Mormonism for a while. Um, uh, the serial Ted, Ted Bundy. I heard his interview before he was executed, and he explained. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I, I heard the beeping. I didn't know if it was the phone or. Anyway, Ted Bundy explained the influences he received early in life with pornography and various other things. And basically I realized that apart from the grace of God, I'm Ted Bundy. There, there was not something in fundament, fundamentally so, so different, what? qualitatively different about him. So yeah, and so and that's and that's 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 a good point. That's a really good good example because how how then do you reconcile somebody who is not Ted Bundy but is an atheist and is still a decent person? I mean, by all respects, of they're kind to people, they donate to charity, they they feed the homeless, they. They help their neighbor across the street. They watch their neighbor's house when they're out of town. Those kinds of things. I, I, I understand. Uh, in, in Luke 18, Jesus describes a Pharisee uh, praying in the temple. You know, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men, uh, even this publican over here. I fast twice a week. I, I tithe of all that I possess. He, he goes through, and he is an outwardly moral man. Um. He's in the temple praying. But when the Pharisees were confronted by God come in the flesh, they end up saying, uh, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and on our children. We have no king but Caesar. My, there are, um, I don't mean to sound dismissive, and I hope you'll understand the qualifiers on this. There, there, there are animals that you see in the wild that seem very docile, very tame, but if you corner them, they're capable of being extraordinarily vicious. And in the same way, so long as we can keep God at arm's length, um, we, we can be pious, we can, you know, uh, and sometimes God uses unbelievers uh, to bless us. But when push comes to shove, I believe that we are uh, enemies of God. We have, one, one of the, the problems people have with hell is they, they picture people in hell being sorry for what they've done. And, you know, that they're somehow victims. My, 
um, my understanding of what we're told about human nature from Scripture. And this is a conclusion. This is not a thus, you know, this is not a um, proof text thing. I can be happy to take you through it sometime if you like. Mm-hmm. But but it deals with the fall. My my understanding is that when those constraints are taken off, you could offer anyone in hell to go into the presence of God and they would refuse because we're we're happy to deal with an idol with a God of our own imagination we're not uh, but to be in the presence of, of a holy God is would make us mad And you see, you see that with what they did to Jesus. You see that with what they did to Stephen. Um, you see that with the prophets over and over. There's a um, there's a visceral hatred of the light. Well, I think that that's, that sounds consistent with what Mormons believe with respect to their idea of the different degrees of of the afterlife. Because we choose, we consign ourselves through our own actions. We we choose to be distanced from God because we don't want to be near Him. I think that that's, if I'm not misunderstanding you, that sounds consistent. So I would. Oh, we're there's there's some similarities. There's some parallels, though we're talking about radically different things. But I mean, I. I Right, I, I think more, more, we are because I, more, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the concept of hell is is real. So I, I think that that's certainly something that is another question that I would have. I don't understand that, but I think it again relates back to the fall and the the nature of the fall and and how because Mormonism Mormonism tends to really focus on those questions, and I think it does so because of the the answers that its doctrine provides. And whether, whether, as you believe, that that's a, an invention that's a conception in order to keep people kind of bound in the religion, because if it is, it works. Um, but if it's not, then at least it does provide some, uh, some consistent message. And so and that's kind of my purpose for talking to you, is I'm trying to understand how, how, how you reconcile some of the things that are seemingly inconsistent. And you had explained... That you suspend your own reason and you go back to the Bible as the measuring stick. And if the Bible says something, then it trumps your reason. Is that correct? I, I Not in the sense that this is some kind of um, anti-intellectual leap of, of faith. Uh, not in, in that regard. What I'm saying is... There are presuppositions that we bring to our reason okay. that can shape what we think is reasonable. Uh, I can I can question the reality of a worldwide flood and say, well, you know, that doesn't seem reasonable to me. Um, maybe it was just a, a localized flood in the Black Sea region when you know when the Mediterranean broke through, and maybe this and maybe that, and you know, let me. Let me take the Bible and fit it to what I think is reasonable. Right. Well, that's not that, that that's dishonest. My my plea to people is read the Bible for what it actually says, and rather than trying to make it contradict itself, uh, allow it to harmonize itself, and accept it as a whole or reject it as a whole. I believe it is cons- it is consistent within itself. I believe that there are uh, very bad arguments that are easily answered by many of the critics. I think that there are challenging arguments that require very careful explanation. Uh, do I claim to have all the answers? No, but I've, I'm 54 years old and in, in through the years, I've heard a bunch of them, and if I don't remember it, I can go back. I've, I've heard the arguments, and I've heard and I've 
presented evidence to the contrary. And I have confidence that the Bible is true. So, you know, I, I, I don't claim to walk around, you know, if you, if you bring up uh, differences in ages, you know, one, one argument that's often made by atheists is um, you have a king coming to the throne at eight years old versus 18 years old. Well, I think, well, I don't know that I really give much credibility to those kinds of arguments, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm just giving it as a for instance. I, I do not believe that the Masoretic text is the perfect preservation of God's Word. I believe it is a very faithful uh, uh, copy of the Old Testament. We, we have... Um, in Isaiah 53, I think we have one basic word difference in all in the whole chapter, and it doesn't affect the context at all. The that being said, there are manuscripts outside the Masoretic tradition. There's the Septuagint, which is a translation uh, that was done earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, generally, uh, it was done about 200 BC. The, there are things in the Masoretic text that um, I think are correctable that they're not, people, people love to pick at the minutia. Uh, the difference between 8 and 18 is a single stroke in, in Hebrew. Right. And um, does it rattle my faith that God did not strike them dead when they copied it wrong, no. But you you would you would and, therefore acknowledge that there are such textual problems. There are textual issues, but but. And I, I don't remember exactly the, the reference, but there's the one in Mark where Christ references Ahimelech instead of Abiathar, and he's got him backwards. Um, uh, he I'd have to go back him. and look at that. Yeah, there's it's Mark. The, and I don't, again, I don't remember it. It's, I don't ever look at it very much, but Christ says that it was during the reign of Ahimelech or Abiathar, whichever one it was, that David took the shoe bread, and it was actually the other one, their son, their father and son of one another, but he's got them, he's got the wrong one as the high priest at the time that it occurred. And so uh, it's something that some people have made it's a, been a while since. It's been a while since I've looked to that. I'd be happy yeah, to. some people have made a big deal these... about it. Either way, I mean, but it, it's one of those things that it's just an error. I mean, it's just an error in the text. Well, and you just accept that it's an error, and it doesn't matter that much. It doesn't really change anything, because well, Christ is saying things, that's not the point of the story that he's telling. Well, things like that are, in my view, important, because... Uh, there are a lot of assertions that are made, and I'm happy to address these. As far as um, the kinds of things I'm talking about, you have um, Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar, um, same same name, uh, but you have um, essentially two letters that are written very similar to one another in Hebrew that are being confused um, with one another. And so, um, I mean, it's just the tails being left off of, of, of the dollar. Right. And it, um, the, the kind... Yes, we have issues that are, in my view, very easily resolved. On the one hand, you have fundamentalists who don't deal with the, with the evidence, and they're simply reactionary, and you, know, you, you start bringing up things like uh, the author of Hebrews quoting from the Septuagint, rather than uh, which seems to give a, a much better reading of the passage than the Masoretic text. Uh, Masoretic text 
you can see the confusion that took place when they were copying it. Um, the Septuagint makes perfect sense. It's 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 basically once again eleven two letters that look similar, and it got confused at one point, and they just kept copying it that way. The um, so you have fundamentalists who, who don't engage the evidence, and they just uh, they'll they'll embrace the King James version as a divinely inspired translation. On the other hand, you have folks that they look at things like um, roughly half the manuscripts of Matthew have Jesus saying it's necessary that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom they come. Half of them have that man, half have the man. Hmm. And they're saying, see, you can't trust the Bible. Well, it, number one, it doesn't even, it, it makes no impact on the text. When you get into serious deviations from the text, you're talking about a tiny number of manuscripts. Uh, I don't I don't remember what I've pointed you to. I've talked to several people over the last couple of weeks, and so you get to 54 and it all starts boring together. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the typical manuscript evidence for a classic work of antiquity stacks about four feet high. Yeah, I, I, I remember that from the video. And then the manuscript okay. from the New Testament's over a mile, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it is overwhelmingly preserved. Um, there are some manuscripts that just have crazy stuff in them. Yeah, I watched a I watched it, a presentation that Daniel Wallace did that where he talks about the reliability of the New Testament copying. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, I'm actually Daniel J. Wallace. He's Daniel B. Wallace. <laughs> my my go by my middle name Jason. So, but. Um, I've never met him, but I'm, I'm aware of his work. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. Yeah. I'm really. Yeah. And like I said, I. It's just for me. It's the. It's the problems that. That are problems to me, and I. And I'm really struggling to get to get over them. It looks like, according to Christianity, God created Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden created an arbitrary prohibition against eating fruit that actually tended to make them more like their creator, cursed them as a result of eating that fruit, cast them into the lone world, and now he changed his method of creation to now sexual reproduction, and those now, you know, different creatures are creating one after another and I get that but my under my problem with that is is that if I came into existence under those circumstances I was of necessity created in that circumstance and that means God has allowed me to be created the way that I am which is imperfect and I don't I do not I cannot reconcile that okay well what let me address it a little bit, if you would. Um, I think, to some extent, it will never make sense until you question your presuppositions. And, and, and so what presuppositions do you think I'm having that I need to question? Because I'm open uh, to doing your, presupp- your, your presuppositions of how do you know what's true. You, you t- seem to be looking more internally than externally. And you are viewing the testimony of Scripture as fundamentally flawed from the outset. And my encouragement to you, and I'm I'm happy to deal with all the various rabbit trails that we could go down. If you, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and we're going to come back to the big picture in just a second here. But I mean, in terms of uh, the genealogies. Between Matthew and Luke, in terms of um, uh, the who, who the priest was uh, with the showbread, uh, in terms of these various things, I'm happy to address any of those. Right. The to some extent, it's going to be hard. You, uh, I'm giving you an outside perspective. To some extent, you've been inoculated against hearing Scripture. Why do what you it think says. that? In term, I'm sorry. Why do you think that? 
you you've got all kinds of conclusions before you come to it that mitigate against its authority. Um, I can address all those various things, but let's come back to the big picture, which I think is what, to some extent, um, you know, as I said, I'm happy to address any particulars that you like, but I think that to some extent it, it would be easy for us to go down those rabbit trails and you lose interest. Let me ask you one thing before I forget. Did I point you to the Gilbert Scharf's uh, James White debate on the fall of Adam and its consequences? I I had I have seen that before, so I didn't watch it again, and I don't remember exactly. I just don't. I didn't like it. I don't like James White. I struggle okay. listening to him talk. I think he's obnoxious. <laughs> he, he he's he's. Um... I think he's not nearly as intelligent as people give him credit for. And, I, and I'm not saying that uh, from a, a Mormon against somebody else. I'm, I'm saying that from a, I've never liked him, even even before it, I joined the church. And so... We all have we all have feet of clay. Uh, I, I, I've been well, around... And, and I'll tell you this. So, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't join the Mormon church as an idiot or somebody that just kind of didn't know what they were doing. And, and I, I'm pretty well versed in most of its theology. And I find that he, he, he goes down and he'll say something that looks like it's correct. And then he just takes a left turn all of a sudden. And he, get, he gets kind of smarmy. And what he says, the, kind of the conclusion that he reaches is wrong. And, it's, it's, it, and you, you, then if you, you approach him on it, he dismisses that as, oh, well, is that your only problem? And, and so I don't I don't really like James White that much. Um, additionally, I think that that was a terrible idea for a debate because the two are coming from completely different foundations. And I think White tried to bash him too much with um, Greek and Hebrew, and it was obvious that the other gentleman didn't didn't have that knowledge. And so he he conceded and said, Yeah, I don't I don't know what that means. I'd have to look in those texts. Um, well, I, I moderated the debate, and we've, we've been over backwards to be nice to uh, Dr. Sharfs because um, it was very clear he wasn't prepared. Yeah, he um, wasn't, and that, that's what my problem was. And I think that I think I, that James was more taking advantage of the fact that he was ill prepared than he obviously was. Well, he was holding back and actually got complimented by. It would have been very easy for James to try to make him look far worse than he did. Why did he? Why did um, you pick him? What was what was the deal with picking Sharps? I I picked Sharps uh, because Sharps was the one who wrote the truth about the God Makers, uh, had written a number of uh, popular LDS books, and I reached out to him and said, you know, we'd like to do a debate. And I don't think he, he knew was what fine. he was doing. He was yeah. fine with it. I'm yeah, sorry. It just, it just was obvious he didn't know what he was getting into. I don't think he knew who James White was. I don't think he was prepared. Yeah, um, well, we, and, we, didn't, we didn't mislead him. No, no, uh, and I don't, I don't think that you did. And I'm not, straight up. We, 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 it was just difficult to when, watch. When, when, when your opening statement is... A joke about what can I get for a rib? Uh, yeah. It, it, um, I don't know what we could have done better to prepare him, but mm -hmm. at any rate, um, I, I encourage you uh, to I'll get a to chance to watch been, the dialogue that it's been a couple James years since I've seen it. Did so. with Alma with Alma already? Oh, you saw the the dialogue that they did recently, or no, no, no? I saw that. I, I had seen that debate you saw, and I found it cringe. Oh, I guess the term is cringeworthy. I didn't. I didn't care for it very much, so I, I didn't. I didn't go watch it again when you posted it. it was sharp and between sharp and white, and then I don't like yeah, white, well, so it was even more difficult to watch. I James came in. I mean, you got to remember this was. I forget. I mean, I think. Are, are you are you a Calvinist? Twenty years ago. Yes. I mean, if you 
depends on what you t- define the yeah, term I, as. Yeah, just generally um, speaking, would you would you agree with his, James his, White on most things? <laughs> his, historically speaking, uh, well, as far as James, yes, his uh, his statement of faith is based on the Westminster Confession. It's uh, it's been tweaked by the Baptists, but in terms of who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation? Yeah, we're we're um, we're in agreement. We, we recently had a dialogue. It was not a debate. It was just a dialogue. Um, it was very respectful. Um, it was the second one we've had between James and Alma Allred, and I think he would find it very, very different in tone. James came prepared for a debate with Sharfs. He had never met Sharfs before in his life, and Sharfs had an impressive resume. And, you know, um, I told him... My issue with him is I think Sharps Sharps is an intellectual and he's a bookworm. He's not. I don't think that he. Uh, yeah, I just don't think he he's not what James is. James is a a person who debates and he does it. Right, and he, he does it effectively. I. Um, but yeah, I. Sharps, I don't. James think he's was prepared for it. James pulled a lot of punches he could have. Uh, and I'll agree with there, you. It was obvious that he did, from from what I remember. Sharps. I don't know what was going on with Sharps. Um, he almost looked like he was. He, came, he, he had a he had a great reputation. But he gets up there, and I don't know if you remember the joke he told. I don't. Um, it was. Uh, I won't give it all the drama, but basically, God makes Adam. And um, there's not a help meet found for him. And, he, and God says, I'll tell you what. He says, I'll, I'll make you... I mean, this is his opening statement. And he does it in um, general conference voice, very slow, very mm-hmm. deliberate, very monotone. He says, God said, I will make you a help meet who will cook for you clean for you and have your children and raise them make every day a joy and all it will take is your right arm and your left leg and Adam goes Ugh, what can I get for a rib <laughs> <laughs> and I'm look, I'm, I'm not already I'm looking at like when he started down this road I'm like oh no yeah, no he definitely he's not going to tell that joke and, and, so, it, and it wasn't it wasn't just a little quick joke either. I mean, it, it seemed like it went on forever. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, but, you, you'd probably get. Um, I can't remember what his name is, but there's a there's an LDS scholar that's written several books that's probably would be a better okay. fit for. Well, we we've, we've reached out. White. We we had we had Gilbert Sharps early on. We had Roger Keller from BYU. He's former mainline Presbyterian who um, he, he was basically neo-Orthodox as a, as a Presbyterian now he's neo-Orthodox as a, as a Mormon um, basically he's, he doesn't believe in the historicity of any of it but um, we did a debate with uh, Roger Keller um, we had um, several others but Dan Peterson put out the word down at BYU, um, no more debates. And it, it became next to impossible to find him. But we, the last debate we had uh, was with Dennis Potter, uh, who's a uh, PhD from, uh, he got his PhD at uh, Notre Dame. And he's a philosophy professor down at UVU. He's now technically Kelly mm-hmm. Potter. Um, he, he left the Mormon church and declared himself a woman. But um, we actually had someone, who, uh, a faithful Mormon, who had been to numerous of the debates, come up to James afterwards and said, please stop this. We don't have anyone who can debate you. Mm. He said, I, I believe Mormonism is true. He said, but this is not... You know, um, he said, you know, this is not the measure of, of truth. He said, but you, um, it was very clear he'd won the debate. But um, we had a dialogue 
Um, well, and, and from my from my perspective, and I think that this is, and I, again, if you want to talk about a presupposition or something that's been beat into me, I like watching debates. Um, my issue with them is, is I don't think that they ever accomplish anything, um, because effectively, especially with something, um, like I said before, with theology, um, any anything you take from the Bible is is a theological presupposition. And so, like you mentioned, the, the gentleman that said, you know, Adam was supposed to die that day. He didn't die till 930 years later. God's a liar. You know, you can say things like that, and you can develop some kind of a presupposition or, a, or a, an argument to reconcile that or say that it's not a problem or whatever, but that's, that's actually just what the text says. You can't, you can't really get around it. Um, what a, can, what I would counter with you can that say later te- like you said later is, texts harmonize that but it is what it well, is my 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 what I, well what I would argue is uh, that's not the end of Genesis and it's not the end of the Bible um, to a great extent what do you do with Jesus you have a you have a clear Old Testament canon by the time you get to Jesus. Um, People question the New Testament, and everything else, but but long story short, it all comes down to Jesus. And what I would encourage you to do is to try to back up and read the Scripture as with with new eyes and without uh, without trying to. Um, my, my brain has slipped a gear. What's the without the the um, critical interpretation? Where well, what's really going on behind it? Take it at take it at face value, but read it and get the big picture. You know, of it, I, which is honestly where we're sort of coming back to now. Well, and I and I I have tried that, and I get I get told to do that quite frequently, as I've talked to you know both Mormon Mormons. I don't think tell you that as much. I think. I think with Mormonism, uh, it, it's much more difficult within the church to view the the scriptures as anything other than because the, and I'll and I'll give you this. This is I think one thing that is a credit to Mormonism. They are critical of the Bible, and I think they're critical of scriptures in general. And I think that to a degree, it makes them read it with more scrutiny. And I think that that's something that causes people to leave the church. And I think that it's designed that way, though. You know, I might get some pushback from Mormons as a result of that, but I think that it's designed that way. Now, with respect to, to uh, from a Christian perspective, I think I'm more told to suspend any critical thinking, and and then, you know, and I and I know you're telling me read it with different eyes, or read it with new eyes, or read it, just read it, and and I get that, but ultimately. When I reach conclusions based on what I'm reading, if I just take the text at its face value, um, and I and I reach something other than the theological conclusion I was supposed to read, then I'm told to suspend my belief. And let me give you one example uh-huh. of that. In the Genesis account, my big issue is is that it's it is it is the deity that's portrayed, and not the serpent that is the liar. I don't see, people often talk about the serpent lying or deceiving the woman, and I don't see that in the text. That's just from its literal reading. I know that people believe you're supposed to reach the conclusion that that God's doing what's best or whatever, but ultimately it looks like God changed his mind, and it is the serpent that is telling the truth and is trying to prosper man, and it is God that's holding them back. And that may seem, and when I tell people that, and they're like, that's blasphemy. But see, that's them unwilling to listen to what I took out of it when I read it. And, 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 I, and, and my encouragement. And they're offended by it. I'm not, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not trying to cut you off. I, what, I'm, what I'm saying on this is there, you, criticism is good if you're circumspect about what you're doing. I'm not trying to get you to suspend criticism. I'm trying to, to encourage you not to atomize the text. And what do you mean by that? The, uh, 
atomize the, the text. way the the way the way that Genesis is written is authoritatively interpreted by Jesus and the apostles. It, uh, that's the reason I'm saying read it as a whole and let it interpret itself rather than imposing a meaning. You, I hope you recognize that your reading of Genesis 3 is very different than how Jesus and Paul would understand Genesis 3. And what I'm saying is um, it's, it's fine to ask questions. It's fine to be critical. But when you allow it to atomize the text, you're not going to hear the text for what it's really saying. Well, let me, let me. You, 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 bear with me for just go a moment. Ahead, you're, go ahead. you're going to come to it with certain presuppositions that you're going that are going to. You, you somewhat have a conclusion before you read it of what it's saying. Right, and and and, and, I, and I'm and telling you, Jason, that. I am, I am, and that's what my point is. I am not doing that. I am reading it, and and. And it, to me, it's clear. And I've asked people to kind of, okay, if I'm wrong, correct what I what I'm what I'm looking at. What am I seeing that's wrong? And and I have I have yet to have somebody do it, for example. So, and, and let me give you a, a a brief little thing, and you can correct me. Tell me how I'm supposed to see it differently, or or even pull from the New Testament if that changes it. But ultimately, so <clears throat> God places the tree. The tree is the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, prior to that time, did man, Adam and Eve, know good and or evil? Yes, I think that they knew good and evil, but not in the same uh, respect. I mean, it's, it's not, I don't see it as an absolute that uh, see, there is no knowledge of... And see, in arguing... I argue that the tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And until they ate whatever was on that tree, they did not know either good nor evil. They're, they were and neutral. Would, and I would argue that that's an imposition on the text. And, and it's well, contrary. Well, no, and so... so to, but, but if that's the case, that is actually what it says. So where in the text... Does it say that they knew good before eating the fruit? And I can't find any uh, place. People say, "Well, they, they knew will. good before." Well, where? I believe it's Romans five, where he's, where Paul talks about the sin of Adam. Okay. The um, where there is it was not, and so we have to interpret. Genesis 3 in the light of Romans. But what about interpreting yeah, it in the light of James, though? So in, in James, um, it's chapter 4, it's the last verse, 417 or 416, whatever the last verse of James 4 is. But it's the, but sin is to know good and not to do it. So that would that would cover both sins of omission and commission. But in order to commit a sin, you have to know good. So effectively, the idea that that, that Adam sinned is is, in, is impossible because he could not have sinned because he did not know good, and that that is just what the text says. I'm not I'm not imposing that on it. It's just what the words say, and anything other than that is a theological imposition. So one could argue that Paul is is imposing a theology on the text that's not there. Well, here's the problem. Who who wrote Genesis? I, I I don't know. I assume people say Moses did, but I honestly I I haven't come to any conclusion one way or the other. Well, who who did Jesus say wrote wrote Genesis? I don't I don't know the answer to that question. Moses. Okay. He is understood to have been writing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Correct. Now, is, uh, is, now to, what did Jesus to, say? To, did to, he say, and Moses said? Or did he say, and Moses wrote Genesis? Uh, he, I'd have to pull it up, but... Uh, 
I see. I'm that way. I'm literal that way. I read the words, and the words are what the words are. I understand, and I'm I'm happy to deal with those. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get you to turn off your brain. I'm trying to get you to take off your blinders, if that makes sense. Right, and I get that, and I and I appreciate that, Jason. I really do. Okay. Well, then, um, one of the things I can show you uh, is that Adam transgressed, which is not just omission, but also commission. Uh, it's an overstepping of the command of God. Okay. But, um, and, that, and that's what I was going to have, ask you. Did he sin or did he transgress? Because, you know, in LDS theology, there's a distinction. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a missing of the mark. Uh, hamartia in the Greek is sin, uh, transgression, I'm drawing a blank off the top of my head. But, um, let me pull it up here. It's kind of like the difference between speeding and speeding because you don't know what the speed limit is. Going back to something that we were talking about earlier, if you're if you're interpreting Genesis three contrary to Jesus, you're wrong. It doesn't okay. mean that it doesn't make Genesis three correct. It doesn't make Jesus correct. My my plea to you is basically don't impose a meaning on Genesis three contrary to what you read in the rest of the Bible. Um, let Jesus and the apostles interpret the Old Testament as a whole. I mean, take take the Bible as a whole and re- either accept it as a whole or reject it as a whole. That's that's my big point. But um, let me see here. Well, while you're um, looking at that, the so. And that's that's where I get to the the purpose of creation. Why were we created? See, LDS theology tries to provide an answer to that, and I think does a decent right. job. And Christianity, I often find we don't know why. So we don't know why God created I, things the way that He created them. We don't know what the purpose of that is. Okay, and what what is that? What is that purpose? First, the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism is what is the chief end of man? And the answer is man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The the great purpose of the creation with God knowing ahead of time that Adam would rebel and bring destruction And we're told Jesus is crucified from the foundation of the world. This is none of this is a surprise. None of this is Plan B. None of this is that we're, we're talking about a God who know who makes everything, controls everything. What is His purpose? His purpose is to glorify Himself and to create and redeem a people to love um, but, but you see how that you see how that doesn't that doesn't make sense and that's my that's my problem um, Jason that doesn't make any sense at all that that just it, that's what I, there, I often get told that and it literally if God's there, there, purpose was to make, with me for just well and, and let me if he was purpose to make a creature that could have fellowship and worship and adore and glorify him in some way or however that is i don't know how i don't know how the god that's described by christians can be glorified more but effectively to be glorified whatever whatever that means i i think that that's not a question that could even be answered but he wants a people to do that why why set up the scenario that he did why 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 put the tree there in the first place and, and the, you know, the answer is so man could have free will. So they could choose to worship God. 
But the problem with that is, is according to most theologies within Christianity, man can't choose to do that. God has to choose man to do that for him. So he has to redeem them, give them a new heart so they can worship him. Once they get the new heart and they can they can worship God, they become part of the people. So effectively, man does nothing. Man literally does nothing to attain the end that God purposed. And so that means that there's a whole bunch of man that's basically becomes cast-offs. He created a bunch of people what? for the purpose of throwing them in hell. What uh, Proverbs says God has made all things for himself, including the wicked for the day of wrath. Uh, let, let me... And you're okay with that? Bear with me for a moment. Uh, what I see in Scripture and what I see in the world harmonize. I see that I am by nature a monster. If given the opportunities, if given, uh, apart from the grace of God, uh, atheism, all the other things in the world, uh, they have nothing to make me human, to make me love. I see that God has made us wondrously, and yet we've shown ourselves, we've shown the depths of our depravity, But Jesus said before, uh, when the time came for him to go to the cross, he said, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. He is going to be arrested, falsely accused, beaten, scourged, crowned with thorns, stripped naked, and nailed to a cross. That doesn't sound like glorification. But it is at Calvary that you see played out, not just in theory, but in, in, in time and space, you have manifest the holiness of God, the justice of God, the wrath of God against sin, and the love of God, the mer tender mercies of God, as at no other time in all of history. I don't pretend to understand all the, I, I, I'm a creature. I'm a finite creature of dust and ashes. I know, I know, but but see, that's what I'm saying, there, Jason. And I'm sorry to cut you off again, but and I, and I appreciate that. But that's one of the issues that I have with with religion in general. Is and I'm not saying I'm I'm going to become an atheist or anything. I'm just saying with religion in general is that that that, that, that all sounds like nice, but those sound like just platitudes that you're are destined to, or intended to make me feel good about stuff, but ultimately they don't answer the questions. God, God's acting in a way that my mind, as finite and, and of dust or whatever that it is, is able to reason and look at this and say, this doesn't make any sense. It does in the context of all of Scripture. And I you, have a God, you have a God who creates the world and drowns every man, woman, child. But why did he do that? Kitty cat, puppy dog. So why did he do that? Plan. Why did he drown them? And why did he Why did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? What was the purpose? Because the purpose because, is very clear. Because God is judging sin. No, no. Why did he we kill are, them all, though? Because but, if, if he... if So... If you take the if you take the argument that he's judging sin and that's why he destroyed the earth and then later Sodom and Gomorrah that's why he had the Israelites destroy the the city of Jericho that I mean if you take those arguments that means that God will always destroy a sinful people right right and yet you also and yet he shows uh, mercy let me qual whoa, whoa, whoa. let me qualify the answer and you look at the history of Israel, and Israel becomes just like them. Uh, I encourage you to read Ezekiel 16. He describes Israel in the coarsest, uh, most vile language. Uh, your mother was an what is it? Your mother was an Ammonite. Well, that's, your father well, that's was because they followed idolatry. He, he describes them as he describes them as a 
a lustful, adulterous woman hiring male prostitutes to come and have sex with her and describes even more vivid language. And yet... He doesn't destroy them. The st- what? But the dis- he destroys many of them. He doesn't kill them all. He doesn't yeah. wipe them off the face of the earth. But, he, but, but out of out of all of this, <clears throat> he saves a people for himself. In the outworking of history, and this is what you have to let the Bible... You can accept the Bible or reject it. You can't edit it. And that's what so many people try to do. They and try so to edit I, it to suit themselves. And, I, and this is the Mormon in me talking. I disagree with that. I don't think that there's any... There is no factual historical basis for that whatsoever other than it is an accepted theological premise within Christianity that you cannot do that. I, I disagree that you can't edit, we, change, alter the we have do we, do, do we treat Scripture as Jesus and the Apostles treated them? Yes, but what is, scripture, what is Scripture as, as, they, as they understood it? That's the problem. They didn't understand Bible, so you don't take the word Scripture out of the New Testament and, and put the word Bible. I mean, Scripture is whatever texts they had available to them at that time. And it didn't no, include the New no. Testament, because it wasn't no, written yet. You, you, you have clearly that you have the law and the prophets you have accepted it would, uh, not just anything that was written was presumed to be the word of God they understood the Pentateuch to have come from Moses was it edited later by Ezra that's a, that's a whole other question that we can uh, talk about but had God spoken and had God preserved his word? Um, Travis, one of you, I'm happy to talk to you at length. My encouragement to you is to step back and question your presuppositions because you've got a tangle of things in there. Well, but, but you see, Jason, you're asking me to just accept different presuppositions. Nope. No, 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 no. I'm not asking you to simply uh, turn off your brain. No, no, no. I, I, I know you're not. Involved. You're just asking me to what replace I'm, some I'm, presuppositions with what others. I'm, no, no. What I'm, what I'm saying is uh, read the Bible, and, and bear with me because I think you think you've done this, but I think you've made clear that you haven't. Back up and read the Bible and let it interpret itself and if you come to a place where something you thought you understood one way is interpreted a different way, and say, okay, I'm going to let this speak for itself and not say, well, this is contradicting itself. I'm going to let it speak as a whole and hear the whole story and then deal with, this, with what Jesus is saying there. And that, I think, is, is, is a fair request it's not turning off anything it's it's step back let the text speak without um, if you don't mind my asking I'm, this is not I'm not trying to dismiss you by age or anything like that how old are you Travis I'm 40 okay um, you're there's going to be um, you, you seem uh, well read I think that you've probably picked up uh, an interpretive grid that um, doesn't bear the way. It's not consistent with how Scripture interprets itself. Well, I've stopped. Um, I, I've stopped doing that years ago. Where, and it's one of the reasons I think that I I've had some issues with the way that the. Excuse me, just one second. Fine. Hello. Um, no, thank you. No, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I was telemarketer. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, um, 
I, I have I given up. I have given up reading that way, and so I've been. I've been just going back to. Um, I, I picked a couple of English, different English versions, and and. Um, well, let me let me. I stopped. Let me go I stopped back to using the, the King James minute, version because I don't like the King James version I'm, anymore. And I'm sorry. I've stopped using the King James version because I don't like it anymore. Um, I found that other okay. versions are a little bit clearer and and better to understand. Um, well, be maybe, careful. Some paraphrase more than they translate. Right, and I and that's why okay. I, I compare them, and I, I I go back and forth when things don't make sure. sense, or you know, I know the King James well enough that I'm able to say, well, this is this is this sounds completely different. So, but no, I okay. My my but so so you you must you must accept though that the idea of sola scriptura is entirely a theological premise. It is not supported by the Bible. It's not. It's not. It's not something that's taught. It's not something that's that's referenced. It, it's the Bible. I mean, Mormons believe the Bible builds on itself. You've got one writer who passes to another, who passes to another, much in they, the way that they believe the Book of Mormon was was created. That that Paul, when he was writing letters, I don't think it even dawned on him he was writing the Bible. He was writing letters. Let, let, let's back up. Who spoke for God in the Bible? Or in, in, uh, from the time of Jesus back, who speaks for God, and how do you know? How do I know that they spoke for God? How did, how did people in the first... What, what do we see Jesus appealing to as... Uh, the reason people should hear him because he speaks the truth okay well he's speaking the truth but how do we know he's how do we know that he's a true prophet that Jesus was a true prophet mm -hmm. what, what was his what was his appeal to the people of, his, of the first century uh, I think that his doctrine was different Okay, but is that is, was that his appeal? Was was that the basis on which he said they should hear him? Uh, against which what? I'm sorry, I missed that last. Why? On what basis was Jesus' appeal that people should hear him as the messenger of God? Well, I think that it varies depending on the circumstances. But for example, I think some people followed him for. Because he could give away free bread and fish, I think that some people followed him because well, he healed the sick. Those people get condemned in John six, right? Right, oh. and I think that. Well, I'm just saying that people followed him for a variety of reasons. Um, I think his that's doctrine. Not, that's, it appears that's not that, one. It appears not why they're following. <laughs> bear, bear with me, just say. I, let me clarify. Not why they're following him. On what basis does he claim to have the authority to speak for God? I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't know that I'm going to get it. Uh, but the fact that he okay. he is the son of God. Okay. Well, how do we know that? How do, uh, how what, do we know what that? You, what you see, what you see with the prophets, with Moses, through the apostles, you have one unfolding revelation of God, and his works we're told that we're to test what a prophet says by uh, if they speak not according to the law and the prophets it's because they have no light in them we're, we're told that if someone if a prophet comes doing signs and wonders and says let us go after other gods you're to reject them if he comes saying things and uh, are going to come to pass and they don't, then know that God didn't send him. The prophets of the Old Testament were not primarily, as many modern people seem to think, uh, working tricks and predicting the future. What you see over and over is they're coming as the messengers of the covenant. They're reminding Israel of covenants that God has made the, the, the curses that are threatened and the blessings that are promised 
and you see this theme all through the Old Testament. And they and the prophets uh, often work miracles. They did tell what would happen. They had they were given sometimes signs and wonders that testified um, whether it's the ten plagues on Egypt, the opening of the Red Sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, whether it's the raising of the dead with Elijah and Elisha, whatever. Um, it was not simply anybody who came along and claimed to speak for God. Everybody said, wow, okay. What you see in Scripture is that there is a standard that God has clearly spoken in the past. And if you're claiming to speak for God now, you need to agree with that, or we know you're wrong. But, but when see, Jesus, that, isn't, that when Jesus why, appeared, isn't that why Jesus was rejected, though? People disagreed that he was consistent with the scriptures? No, just the opposite. Uh, Jesus said, uh, if, if you, uh, I mean, one place he says, if Abraham were your father, you believe me, but you're of your father the devil. Right. Um, but he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. And they bear witness of me. So, the, he's, so he's pointing away from the he, scriptures, though, to himself. No, he's not. He's pointing to the scriptures. He says the scriptures cannot be broken. He says that um, over and over he's saying that the scriptures are testifying of him. And he shows the fulfillment that all that's spoken in Moses uh, and the law and the prophets must be fulfilled. He, he goes through over and over that this is the fulfillment of the scriptures and he points them to the scriptures um, when they come to him trying to catch him in his words they, they give him these things is it, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar they figure yeah, it's one of these things have you stopped beating your wife if he says yes it's right to pay taxes to Caesar he's going to alienate the people if he says no then the Romans will come and, and kill him Right. So uh, you have the Sadducees come and they give this you know, ridiculous story of, you know, here's this woman who had seven husbands and the last while the woman dies, whose will she be in the resurrection? But Jesus then turns back to Scripture. Where, where does uh, so that in that in that in that, that example just, where does he bear, do bear that? With me. Bear with me for okay. a second. All right. Um, when he's tempted in the wilderness. Twice, Satan quotes scripture, and Jesus rebuts him with scripture, quoting from Deuteronomy. And then, of course, he drops the, the pretense of scripture together, and, and uh, but still, Jesus answers him with scripture. In this case, you've got these people, they've been asking him these unscriptural things, but then he points them right back to scripture. He says, the Messiah, whose son is he? And they said, David, yeah, this is Bible 101. Messiah is, David, is the son of David. He says, then how does Saint David in the spirit call him Lord? He's referring to Psalm 110. How is David's son David's Lord? And from that point, they dare not ask him any more questions. Because they were imposing on the scriptures what they wanted them to read. They were not honestly reading them. And what you see is the more that the, the scriptures are pushed on them, the more they reject them, the, the further they move from the scriptures, and the more bold they can become in their hatred of Christ. And so here you have this Gentile governor, John, crucify your king. We have no king but Caesar. Here are these ultra-nationalist Jews that when push comes to shove, they don't care about the scriptures. They don't care about anything. They care, you know, when it really boils down to it, crucified. They send, you know, Jesus described in the parable, they send word to the king, we will not have you to rule over us. 
And, and and I get that, but I mean, couldn't couldn't it just as easily been be inferred from the passages that you had that Jesus was coming up with odd, unusual, and strange interpretations of the scriptures that were unknown to them? Not at all. Why is why is that not a possibility? So, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, he goes through and he actually is interpreting the scripture much more rigidly. You know, he says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You've heard it said, and I say unto you. And so he's he's changing the specifics of what the scriptures actually say, and he's adding to or changing them in a way that's that's not ordinary with what they understood. Because, like with divorce, he said, Moses, uh, uh, he said it was for the hardness of your heart that God did this. Right. There's, you have, you have a progressive revelation that's not new and contradictory, but rather an unfolding of these things. That you're seeing that the command is to love, to love God and to love your neighbor. And those quotes are out of the Old Testament, you know, they're out of Leviticus. And, right. Um, it's so, in Deuteronomy anyway. But, so he's changing they're quoting, they're, they're quoting from... No, what he's doing is he's taking them back to the heart of what Moses taught in the first place. The command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is from... Um, Oh, my brain is shot today. I know, oh, you're fine. I get it. I get what you're saying. Uh, I'm just saying that... The... They took... You know, people... People can take anything you say and twist it so long as they don't let you keep speaking. And so long as they don't allow you to context... The, um, if you say that you love your dog and you love God then people say he said he had the same relationship with God as his dog right. um, you know uh, if you're married you know, you say you love your wife and you say you, you love your dog uh, that must mean you mean exactly the same thing no we take the totality of what you say to give that context and people twist the word of God by ripping things out of context and not allowing the rest of scripture to interpret it I'm not giving this as an apologetic that the latter part proves you know, how do we know what's true I'm happy to deal with that um, you know, what we talked about a little bit earlier but you have to let the scripture speak. You, you can't go to it in the same way if somebody's trying to trap you in your words. If someone's convinced that you're a liar, they're going to they're going to read everything through a prism, and they 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 pretty much come to what you're saying with a conviction they're seeking to prove, and that's not fair, and it's not fair for the scriptures either. So, um, I would encourage you, I think the dialogue between, uh, I'm not trying to push James on you, but I think that the dialogue between James and Alma was... I'll watch uh, it. I'll watch it again. It. It's been, a, it's been, gosh, it, it's been three or four years maybe since I've seen that. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll point. I'll, I'll send you the link. Watch it if you like. You don't have no, to. No, you, you've um, already sent it to me. I'll I'll, but, I'll pull it up. Okay, because it's a respectful, substantive. I I didn't like the format. Alma, Alma has odd, odd ideas on things sometimes. Um, oh, you're talking about Alma. I'm but, sorry. Yeah, send me that one. I don't have that one. Yeah, yeah. This is this is Alma. This is a dialogue we did in July with Alma and James. Okay. And uh, it was a it was a weird setup. 
but it was, but I thought it was great because it was respectful and it was substantive. And the thing about debates and dialogues, and to me a dialogue is just a less formal debate, but where you get people talking about where they disagree, especially where it's respectful. And it's hard to be respectful to people you don't know. Alma and James have known each other for, for 30 some odd years. Um, and um, I, I was very happy to hear Alma start off his presentation that there are LDS who say that, you know, James, you know, aren't, aren't I concerned James is going to be dishonest? He said, I've known James for over 30 years. I disagree with him on numerous things, but I've never known him to be dishonest. And, um, you know, it was very respectful. It was, it was, it was good. But it, it's easy to caricature other people when there's not conversation. And Anyway, I, I'll, I'll send you the link on that. Yeah, please do. Um, my, let me tell you this. This isn't meant as a platitude. To some extent, um, why did God do it this way? In one way, in one sense, I don't know. I'm not God. Uh, I've heard Reformed theology summed up. God is God and we're not. And I, I, I sort of like that. I, I just, and I have issues with that. I think that that's, to me, to a degree, I think that, that sounds like a cop-out. Uh, no. Um, the, the older I get, I... Because why, why weren't we made I, where we can understand? Right. By whose standard? By whose standard is it unfair? It's not unfair. I'm not. I'm not talking about the fairness of it. I'm just saying why. Why are we? Why were we made where we can't understand? Why are we made where our thinking is so different? Why were we made where our think, our ability to comprehend is so deficient? I mean, we're pretty intelligent, I think, right? I don't think that. It, you see, what I read in scripture is that the problem is not our intellect. It's our character. Uh, if you if you want if you want it uh, put in pithy form, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We're not. It's not ignorance that damns us. It's the evil in us. We are we are a race of child rapists, mass murderers. We are a race of uh, people who commit suicide. We're a race of warmongers. We're a race of monsters. Uh, people love to demonize the Mormons who are outside of the church. In an earnest plea, I dealt with Mountain Meadows, not because I was trying to demonize them. Apart from the grace of God, I've been there with them. But there's a tendency to say uh, that we're basically good people and we're ignorant, and you know, or there's some problem. You know, the problem is ignorance. Uh, I've lost count of how many times I've had Mormons tell me they think I'm a good man. I think you're a terrible person, to... so. <laughs> so. Well, until they watch the videos, not me, even one's card. Back when I used to, back when I used to do the TV show, they like Mormons would always stop me. I, 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 for what it's worth, I've always said I'll take the hatred of the Mormons over the love of an awful lot of anti-Mormons. But um, uh, the anti-Mormons generally hate me um, because. I tell them, you know, uh, God says, love your enemies. And, I mean, if you want to view the Mormons as your enemies, you got to, you're supposed to love them. And what matters is truth, not, you know, um, the fundamental issue with Mormonism is not tithing and temples and uh, 
control and all the other things that people get all hyperventilating over is that they're robbing God of his glory and that they're leading people to outer darkness forever. And so the anti, you know, um, Mormons, when we did the TV show years ago, they'd stop me on the street. Hey, you're that guy. They can almost never remember my name, but you're that guy. I love your show. I'm devout Mormon. And it's like, you know, I try to politely say, you, you understand them saying that Joseph Smith was a false prophet who's leading you down our eyes. Oh, yeah, we know. But we like your spirit. And it's when like, you, and I, I and I, you more. To a degree, to a degree, I can understand that because they view you as being deceived just as much, and and at least you're honest about what well, you believe, and they can appreciate that. So I mean, for, well, for, for, for well, for example, so saying that that um, you believe that Mormons Mormonism robs God of His glory, I think that the the very basic argument to that would be. You know, in our theology, God can self-replicate. God can create more of himself and is thereby glorified just as he was when Jesus was exalted. And so if God can exalt and he can exalt them to the level of himself, that's a more glorious God than a God that creates creatures that are deficient, which is what Christianity dictates. Well, the... Um, I think that... Sean McCraney made my life much easier Sean because Mc... he bent over backwards to be obnoxious. Oh, Sean McCraney's and, insane. And I, huh? Sean McCraney's insane. He's oh, lost, yeah. He's I completely mean, uh, lost uh, his mind. For what it's worth, I, I've, I've told our ruling elder here that um, he's a fellow elder in the church. I told him, I said, if I ever end up dead, don't look to the Mormons, look to the McCraney Acts uh, because they're, they're insane. Uh, they're they're vicious. Um, I mean, I, I he's he's just got an animosity in him that I don't know where it comes from. He's he's awfully angry. I do, I do, and it's a dark place. But I see. I I actually I've, I've lost count of how many times I've told you know, on the TV show. I used to tell Mormons if I was a Mormon, I would be hard pressed to take most of my critics seriously. Because, unlike many of your critics, you have a visible church. You have a call to holiness. It's the word of wisdom, which is an awful lot like Colossians 2, touch not, taste not, handle not. You know, I think it's unbiblical. But, you know, there's a sense in which we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be separate from the world. Um, you're accountable within a community. When many people think that, uh, you know, this is all, uh, they refuse to see that you had a visible church in the first century. Uh, you think that tithing and the Sabbath are opportunities to glorify God. And, um, you know, I think that there's some fundamental confusion, but you're basically right. At the same time that many of your critics shout legalism at anything that impinges on what they feel like doing well and i think and, that a lot of uh, a lot of lds people have the understanding that that's just that's a a chicken or the egg argument with respect to legalism or grace grace and works working interchangeably with one another i think that fundamentally i don't well, think mormonism or christianity has any dis difference we just we're arguing past each other but they're arguing the same thing i've had this argument a million times with people where they say you know you guys believe that you you work to get grace and we believe that we we have grace and we're saved and we work spring from that and i uh, i don't think that go back, go back and read mcconkey uh, mcconkey actually said that that grace was a reward for works and faith was a reward for works i know but he's doing that from the perspective of of the light of christ and I think that those are often there. There are there are fundamental doctrines and principles that are just understood. So when I read, for example, Paul's epistles, I don't know for sure, but there are things that he taught, that he references, that he does not clearly explain, and he doesn't clearly explain them because he went to the Galatians and he taught them the gospel with his own mouth, 
And what he's doing is he's reminding them of what he taught. He's calling them back to remembrance. And so the same thing with a lot of the writings of the leaders of the church. I think they do the same. They they take for granted. So people say that in the LDS church they don't talk about Jesus enough. Well, our understanding, I think, for the most part, is that we just take for granted that that's always inferred. And so we don't constantly say Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. Because for us, everything came from him because it's a result of the atonement. And so I don't, I don't know that necessarily some of the accusations that are, are correct in that respect. But as far as grace, we believe that we received grace at birth as a result of the, the atonement. The atonement cleansed us from the original effects of the, of the fall. And I think that okay, that's... Okay, well, we're, we're over two hours, and I've got to take care of some other stuff. No, 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 you're fine. Yeah, I was just going to okay. say we probably ought to um, cut it, shut it short. Listen, I'm, I'm happy to talk more. I'm not trying to shut you down. No, 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 I get it. Yeah, and, and uh, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll think, and then why don't you send me that, that link for that debate with, uh, okay. with uh, you, James and Alma? I'll send, you, I'll send you a link as well. Um, there's a fellow who came to the first dialogue that we put on between those two. Uh-huh. Bright, uh, bright guy, and he said that it was actually that interaction that got him thinking and questioning, and um, he, he ended up um, embracing our understanding of things. Right. Let me let me address your big question as a teaser, if that works. Okay. Um. I may be tempted to imagine all the what-ifs out there, but what I see in the scripture makes sense of this world. Every other position leads to absurdity. Uh, I do not believe that, science, that, that empirical evidence is the measure of all truth, because science it's built on presuppositions that and, can't be proven by And science. I would agree with you. Absolutely. And so there are, um, we have to look at our epistemology. Right. I believe that the scriptures make clear we were created in the image of God. There is a greatness in us. And yet there is a, there is a fundamental brokenness, a fundamental uh, evil in us. And only Christianity really explains that in a consistent way. The um, what I see in the Scripture is that God is beyond my comprehension in how He does some things. Uh, I don't know why He does some of the things He does. Some things He's given clear revelation, and I still have questions about Him. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know how it all fits together, and yet at the same time, there uh, you're familiar with the hymn "Amazing Grace," right? Yes. Uh, by John by John Newton. Right. Very very famous hymn. There's another hymn that he wrote that I think captures the piety that I'm trying to get you to understand uh, I think I think that helping you get your head around the substance of it will help take you to other places uh, in terms of maybe embracing it at some point but, you, but to some extent you have to hear it first um, John Newton slave trader radical conversion becomes a Christian pastor he writes Amazing Grace, numerous other classic hymns. But one that very seldom gets sung is one that deals with God in a way that is very, very different from the happy, clappy, um, self-improvement religion that many people try to make Christianity into. The lyrics go, I ask the Lord that I might grow in love and faith and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer. 
but in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart, and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand he seemed to intend to aggravate my woe. Crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds, and laid me low. Lord, why is this, I trembling cried, will thou pursue thy worm to death? Is in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest find thy all in me. Hmm. That is a radically different piety than not only Mormonism, but much of what calls itself evangelicalism today. And it is my prayer that I can help you understand that, and I'm happy to do anything I can towards that end. I appreciate it. Pleasure talking with you. I think this was a whole lot better than um, texting. Yeah, it, it's oh, it is. It's better to it's better to talk than it is to do this. But I mean, it's nice to to use the messaging to kind of define what we're talking about, so we don't get off on tangents. Yeah, it's it's easy. We don't get all the inflections. We don't get to hear the qualifiers as well. We it's um, I, when when I'm talking to somebody on Messenger, I'll leave you with this. But, I'm happy to talk about Messenger about anything, so long as you assume that I'm not trying to offend you. I know, well, and, and that's so. And I'll tell you this: I'm I'm actually a little bit of a sociopath. I struggle with emotional connections. I struggle with emotional period, and so I use words with their intended meaning and intent. And so when I do the when I do that, I don't often realize I'm offending people because I think that people often read screaming into my words or anger when there isn't any and so i don't get offended you're welcome to write whatever you want just realize i'm going to read it with a very deadpan response i'm not going to i'm not going to think i'm being yelled at or, or berated and you're welcome to say whatever you want because i i uh i want to just know what you're thinking well for what it's worth i actually said in my sermon on sunday uh that apart from apart from the grace of God, I am a sociopath, <laughs> and not just a little one. Um, but it's an added qualifier for today. But yeah. the the glorious news of the gospel is that Jesus came into this world to save sinners, to save the ungodly, right. and that's my only hope. Well, I appreciate that. All right, all right, Jason. Talking with you, and uh, I'll send you some links. Appreciate I'll send it. you a link to a guy. I'll, well, I'll give him a heads up that you may contact him, but he won't contact you I'll unless you, you reach out to him first. I think that um, he he was raised in Mormonism. Did I did I in, uh, infer that you converted to Mormonism at some point? I did. Yeah. Were you raised in it as well? I I was a young. I was a youth, but it's been a long time. That's I, I inferred that from something you said earlier. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send you his connection, and the ball will be in your court if you want to reach out to him as well. Okay. I'm happy to talk to you. Sure. Um, I'm just I'm juggling twenty dozen different things at any given time, so no, I, um, I might be a little hard to reach. But you know, at the same time, don't don't. Don't hesitate to be persistent if I'm if I don't follow up quickly. I won't. I appreciate. It. Thanks, Jason. Have a good rest Pleasure of your day. Pleasure talking with you. Bye bye. Take care.